Hi guys, so today I interviewed the great uh, Josh Elizetti. So Josh is uh, like a Steve Jobs of e-commerce. And I say that because he's the founder of Snow, which is uh, like the apple of uh, oral care. And uh, their patented uh, teeth whitening system has revolutionized uh, the space and counts hundreds of celebrities as customers, such as um, Floyd Mayweather, for example, one of the highest uh, paid um, athletes in the world. And it's high tech meets high fashion in a space that hasn't changed in nearly 100 years. So Josh not only is doing well with e-commerce and scaling his, uh, his business very fast, but also he does it in a way where he is basically disrupting the industry. So it's very exciting, uh, very exciting interview and I'm very excited to have uh, Josh here today. And he also created some of the largest brands in multiple industries with uh, millions of monthly shoppers and A-list celebrity business partners. So, very excited to have Josh here. Um, hi Josh. Um, and the first question for you is basically, um, tell us more, how did you get started? How do you get started you know, with, with advertising, with e-commerce? Um, is what Was it something you studied in, in university for? Or is that something that you figure out by yourself? So, thank you from here, Josh. With inspiration and really <clears throat> when I started about 12 years ago, it was really just to make money. Uh, and I wanted to figure out how I could make some money. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to help my family out. I wanted to help myself out. And, um, you know, and, and no one would hire me because I was too young to work a regular job. So uh, I learned how to program. Um, I, I was self-taught just through Google and books, uh, mainly through books at the time. And uh, after reading <clears throat> a bunch of books, I said, wow, I think I could do something here. And so I started to program. Uh, I started to make websites, uh, just, just all sorts of stuff. And uh, started to create blogs. And I started to uh, write for these blogs. And so I had you know, a few different blogs with you know, different pen names for each blog. And then um, you know, once the, you know, I was in high school at the time, I was a, a freshman in high school. So I was 14, 13, 14 years old. And so uh, my teachers would ask, you know, what are you, you know, what are you doing on the computer, or what are you working on, or, and uh, I would tell them, <clears throat> and they said, oh well, I have a friend that uh, needs a website, or I have a friend that needs this, and so they said, you know, how much do you charge for that? And I said, I, I didn't know. I remember having to go to Google and say, like, what do, you know, what do I charge for this? And so I had to learn everything just by by googling it and YouTubing it and reading books, and so. Um, luckily, I'm a voracious reader. I I, uh, I, I learned something early on. I, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never grew up saying I want to run my own business or I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I really wanted to be in the medical field. I wanted to be, you know, uh, either a plastic surgeon or a cardiologist or, you know, I wanted to be a doctor of some sort, maybe a pharmacist. And so uh, I knew that I wanted to be successful, but I didn't have that framework in my family uh, where uh, entrepreneurship uh, was like you know a huge thing in, in, in my family. So um, with that being said, I had very supportive uh, parents, and they said, okay, as long as you keep your grades up, you can do whatever you want. So for me, reading was, uh, and I, I recommend reading to, to everyone, especially people who are shifting careers or getting interested in something new. So I read everything, uh, started to make some money, and I think once you realize that uh, you like doing something, you're pretty good at it, and you can make money at it. Once you hit those three check boxes, the rest kind of takes over. And if you're smart enough, you're going to double down and learn more and more. And so the way I got into marketing and advertising and branding was I went from programming to design. And I've always been a huge fan of beautiful design, luxury products, premium uh, design. So we started designing. Uh, I started designing. And uh, eventually I started to have to hire um, people to help me because uh, we started getting a lot of work coming in. I started getting a lot of work coming in. And then um, <clears throat> I remember being young at the time and I had to deepen my voice, you know, on the phone. So I sounded older. Um, you know, I remember having to, you know, do all sorts of stuff um, to, because I was insecure about my age and I just, I didn't want that to be a reason why people didn't want to work with me. And so um, I had to learn a lot of things very, very quickly from, you know, um, bookkeeping, uh, you know, I did my own bookkeeping, programming, designing the site, Photoshop, slicing it up. And then uh, I started to learn about search engine optimization and uh, I was really fascinated by it. And I had a, a client of mine come to me one day and said, if you learn how to sell things and you know how to market and brand, 
uh, that's the real the superpower over everything. So I started reading every book I could on branding from Seth Godin to you name it, Robert Cialdini on influence, writing copy. And so I became obsessed with that. And so I went from programming, design and branding to marketing and sales. And that's what really propelled me uh, to be able to build a company with 80 plus full-time employees. Uh, I graduated university at 20 years old. So I came in came in and, uh, and, and left two years later with my degree. I, I finished as quick as I could. And, uh, I kept my promise to my parents that I would keep my grades up. So I had straight A's, uh, you know, but was running my business. And it was a very, uh, very hectic time because I was having to go to college, uh, you know, full time. I was taking, you know, double the amount of classes than every other student. I had to get multiple approvals to do that. But I also had to run my business. And I also had, at the time, maybe two dozen uh, offshore employees or, or you know, out, out of house employees because I had to be in class uh, so I couldn't be in an office. So I had to learn how to do all of that just by the desire to grow, the desire to learn. So that's where I got started. Kind of it's evolved uh, over time from, uh, from all of that. And now we own, uh, you know, we own our brands, we own the patents, we own the trademarks. Uh, we own the, uh, we have the celebrity endorsements and the celebrity partners. So really coming full circle from learning a couple skills, becoming really good at it, um, selling those skills as a service, taking the money from that, building a platform that I sold three and a half years ago through that, through that same company, um, you know, selling, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of products through that platform for our clients, taking a percentage uh, each time. Then using that money, you know, I started with $20. And just kept snowballing that in back, 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 back to finally, uh, now we've got several brands, Snow being the uh, you know, fastest growing, the most well-known uh, brand of all. And uh, we have no outside funding. We have no debt. We have uh, you know, no investors. Nobody's put money in aside from myself. So we're really proud of the fact that we're able to spend millions and millions of dollars each year on research and development. And it's all internally funded. Uh, to continue to grow what, 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 what we started. Well, this is, this is fascinating. Um, so, um, so you created some of the largest brands in multiple industries with millions of monthly shoppers and A-list uh, celebrity business partners. How do you feel about it? And um, what do you think were reasons for your, for your success? I mean, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people start companies, right? But not everyone, you know, starting like the company and now like the company is like just blowing up. Do you think that's like combination of the skill set that you had or maybe your ability to find good business partners or ability to find like good employees? What do you think is the main reason? I would say it's between, it's, it's between two things. Um, I would say that I got really good at building companies uh, up to, you know, five to $10 million, you know, um, and I always say it's, it's kind of a joke, but it's not really, is that I got sick and tired of, you know, making a billion dollars, you know, and I got tired of that challenge. And I, I realized that in order to hunt an elephant, which is the bigger, the bigger thing, um, because when I sold my company, uh, my largest company a few years ago, I was depressed for about six months. I, uh, you know, I kind of took a, a break. Um, I weighed a lot more. I was, I was overweight. Um, I was just, you know, I, I wasn't happy with myself in terms of, you know, I was working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you know, and I had nice things. I had the Lamborghini, I had the Ferrari, but I wasn't happy with myself. And I realized that the reason why I wasn't happy is because, uh, it, I was on this pursuit to happiness and I thought that once I sold it or once I, you know, had millions of dollars or once I had the Lamborghini, the Ferrari, that everything would be great. And it was, it was, I, I was, I was proud of myself and proud of my team, but I realized the pursuit is happiness for an entrepreneur and that I was addicted to the joy of achievement, the joy of growth. And so when I lost that vehicle to be able to grow, I lost my purpose. And so for me, I, I realized that I needed to do something that was big, something that was going to challenge me for 50 years and something that I could double down in. And I realized that we had to own everything. We had to own the patents, the trademarks. We have, I have to be willing to put all my money on the table to double down on this, to hire the best lawyers, the best engineers, the best scientists. So for me, it was, it was time for me to say, 
I, I have to do something big because if I want the best people in the world to work with me, I want the best team in the world, I have to be the best leader. And so in order for me to be the best leader, I had to change my mindset. So the two things that, that really propelled it was the mindset of thinking bigger, thinking longer term, and thinking, how can I do something? There are thousands of, of different opportunities. Which one can, can I do for 30 years? Which one is a big enough market? Which is something that I have an, an unfair advantage in or something that I, I, I feel like I could do better, 10 times better than everybody else? And uh, that's when I started to look at the opportunities and even, even though there are thousands of them, if I take them through that checklist, it whittles it down to maybe 100 or maybe 50. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you know, I realize, okay, I can't do it alone. You can't hunt an elephant on your own. You can hunt a squirrel on your own. But the thing with the hunting the squirrels is every day you have to hunt the squirrel because you have to keep eating. If you hunt an elephant, you can feed a village for a month. Uh, and so you hunt less, uh, less elephants. But because the kill can feed so many people, um, you know, you, you're able to strategize and you're able to think about that. And so the way I thought about that was when you're hunting squirrels, strategy is not very important. It's more about the tactics. It's like, okay, I'm going to put a net right here. I'm going to do this. Uh, what is the tactic? Tactics make you rich. Strategies make you wealthy. And in order to, to hunt the elephant, you have to use strategy. You have to have a team that you can trust. And that is the best. And so all of that went into my mind of thinking, okay, I need to build something that is going to be big, something that is not just for the sake of money. The thing is, what I realized is once you have the, the, everything that you need, once you make really honestly in America, once you make really 200000 a year, you have everything that you can ask for, depending on where you live. But, um, you know, you have, you know, food, shelter, security, um, you can take care of your family. Um, you know, you're pretty good. You get 200000 a year, um, depending on which location. If you're in L.A. or New York, maybe 300000 You live like a, a wealthy person. You can eat whatever you want to eat, essentially. You can go out. You can travel pretty pretty openly. You're not going to be flying private jets and doing these things, but you live a very, very, very good life. So you have to look internally beyond that if that's something that you want. If you want to build something big, you can't do it for yourself. Um, you have to do it for the impact and for the greater good and for your team because people want to be involved in building something that is truly going to be legendary, something that they can put on their resume or they could talk about for years and years. That's why people work for Steve Jobs. It wasn't because they were going to make good money. It's because they knew that they were changing an entire industry. And uh, that's something that I wanted to, to, to take on. And I realized that if I, if I didn't do it, I was going to be depressed and I wasn't going to be happy. And, you know, the last two years of my life have been <clears throat> the most fun, exciting, exhilarating, uh, challenging. Um, you know, we get people trying to knock us off all the time. So we have to go and, you know, enforce our patents, enforce your trademarks. Uh, so it's, it's fun. It's the, it's the art of war. It's, it's, it's our sport. And I've been the happiest I've ever been the last two years because my health is in order. Even though I'm a little sick right now, but uh, I lost the weight. I feel great mentally. I feel great. My team is, is phenomenal. And so I think that if you put something in the, in the air and you say, what am I doing right now? And how can I make it 50 to a hundred times bigger? And what does that look like? And you go through that mental practice, you start to realize the type of people that you need to hire, the type of people you need to associate yourself with and the type of people you need to listen to. So I'm very careful with who I listen to in podcasts and in uh, YouTube videos, etc. You know, I'm listening to people that um, have built legitimate brands that are very massive. John Paul DeJoy is one of my favorite from Patron Tequila and Paul Mitchell Cosmetics. He's mm -hmm. one of my favorite entrepreneurs. Obviously, there's Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, all, all of these guys. But I'm always looking for those people that I can model after because you're the, you're the five people you hang around with, but you also become the five people you listen to uh, yeah. on a daily basis and you follow Wow, this is good. Um, so with your Snow Whitening brand, uh, so you focus heavily on the product, right? You invest a lot into uh, like product development and you made the product both like visually appealing and effective in use. So you're literally transforming the industry here. And um, why do you think like no one has done before you? Like, why do you think no one has done this before you? Well, I mean... <clears throat> It's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it's a huge risk what we're doing as well. It's, um, you know, to t take uh, a market where people are used to spending $50 in the store for white strips or they're used to spending, you know, $500 in the dental office. Yeah. And we create, we've created that middle market and we've re we really own that middle market. There's no one else in our category, um, you know, that, that is in that space at the level we're at. We have 2 million monthly shoppers. Um, you know, the, the, our refund rate is less than 0.5%. Uh, the product we, we give a five-year warranty, etc. But you know we've spent millions of dollars to to really revolutionize. And th the thing is, you know, I come from a background of, of technology, but I've also been selling beauty products um, and working with beauty companies for you know a decade. And so I love the beauty product uh, category uh, and and personal uh, care uh, areas because it actually makes a difference for people. Um, it's, it's very competitive, um, hyper competitive. That's, that's the real reason why people have not done this. The other reason is, uh, for example, our new system, you know, we we have a, a version of it, uh, which is in my car. It's a 23.75 carat gold. Um, we're doing an addition that's going to sell for $10,000 in March. It's, uh, dipped in gold and mm -hmm. covered in Swarovski crystals. And uh, the mouthpiece will be filled with Swarovski crystals, and it's ten thousand uh, dollars the price uh, to, to buy that one. So you know that's crazy to think of taking this very high end approach into a space that is really boring, um, and it's very difficult to do. That's very expensive to do that um, unless you raise a lot of money or you are just you have to market and advertise. What we're doing is it's a it's a really fine balance that, that we play and I live off of risk. I, I enjoy calculated risk and it's like when you're spending millions of dollars a month on advertising and you're spending millions on research and development, you're constantly playing the seesaw um, in order to propel the brand forward. And then you've got this whole celebrity side of things, um, which is, which has never been done in the space before. Um, and you have three big companies. You've got Crest, Colgate, and Sensodyne, which is owned by GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, you've got these three very large companies. Um, and I, I'm very thankful to Crest White Strips because they um, educated the consumers that there's a, there's a way to whiten at home. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful to the dentists, and we sell to hundreds of dentists, that they have, um, you know, they talk about the benefits of, of whitening in the office. All we've done is we've taken what White Trips has done with convenience and the science and technology of the in-office treatments and put it in the palm of your hand uh, where you can do it at home. Uh, the new system is waterproof. You can shower with it. You can swim with it. You can take your makeup off with it. You can drive with it. It, it cleans itself. Um, so we're taking high tech meets high fashion in the oral care space um, where it's approachable. It's not... You know, the system sells for, the wired one sells for 150 the wireless sells for 299 So it's not like it's out of this world uh, where you're like, oh, I can't buy that. Anyone can buy it. And that's very important to us is that we want to create products that, at the end of the day, we're selling confidence and we want to be able to get the products uh, to everybody that we can. And every single order that we sell, we help a child who doesn't have access to dental care. And that's important to us too. So it's, it's important that we have a scalable business model where we can sell toothpaste, mouthwash in every single store. We ship to 180 countries right now. And I'm in the process. I just closed a deal with a company in China um, who's, who's rolling all of that out. Um, you know, we're doing deals in the Middle East, Dubai. Uh, and we're doing re retail work all around the world. Uh, uh, and, and people are seeing what we're doing and they're wanting to become a part of it. And it's really exciting for us because... Um, we're creating something that's never been done before. It's like how Apple came into the PC market and they made it sexy. You know, the, the iPhone is sexy and, and, and you want to use it. Not only is it superior in terms of technology, and maybe it doesn't have all the nuts and bolts of an Android where you can edit this and edit that. At the end of the day, I want to use an iPhone. And when an iPhone comes out, I want to use it. It's simple. It's sexy. It's sleek. It's good looking. It looks good in my hand. And that's why we've, modeled ourselves as the apple uh, of oral care um, because design is important technology is important and scalability in terms of price points important all of that has to be together that's what we we we're unlocking here uh you know for the first time in this market how, how much time did it take you to to develop this product 
<clears throat> version. So I have the I have some of the best engineers in the world, uh, and uh, I'm very thankful to them because we essentially did three years of work in about eight months of time, um, and that's just you know working around the clock, uh, constantly on calls, constantly in person, constantly figuring things out, breaking things, fixing them, breaking them, fixing them, and um, so we. You know, it would have taken us three years for this new system, and it took us eight to nine months, which is a fascinating feat in engineering because we're taking um, all the technology, essentially like the technology that an iPhone has, our mouthpiece that fits in the size uh, palm of your hand, has um, gesture recognition. You can shake it to wake it, shake it to turn it on, Bluetooth technology. Uh, you know, it's got red light therapy, blue light therapy automatic shade detection, it detects the shades of each tooth and automatically changes. I mean, the, the amount of technology in a palm, the palm of your hand, and then to make it look sexy and then it's sleek. Um, and then on top of that, we have the world's first teeth whitening app. Um, so it's just called Snow because we've got other products coming that'll be on that platform. But um, you know, to build the software, and then to build the firmware, and then to build the hardware, and then to build the design around that, the branding, the marketing, all of that, we did all of that in nine months' time, and that would have taken years and years. It takes companies years and years to do that. Um, you know, Crest just came out with uh, a whitening uh, light, you know, product that took them years to create, and that's a you know multi-billion-dollar company. It took them years to create it. We've created something that's a hundred times better in eight or nine months of time. But that's because you know there's a there's a video I love to watch. It's two minutes long. It's Jack Ma from Alibaba talking to his team in 1999, telling yeah, them yeah. that, that that's a good know, one. Yeah, yeah. One of us, you know, one of us is worth ten of them um, because we are focused, yeah. and that's how I talk to my team. That my team, they're the best in the world, and we're like the Spartans, right? It's the David versus Goliath. I said it's not about the numbers; it's about the hunger that we have to show the world that there's something better, and we will never stop. We are relentless on our on our pursuit. And we don't care about what the competition does. We don't care. We are focused and we are just going, going, going. And uh, so long story short, it took, took about a year to formulate the serum, build the first version of the product. And it took nine months to build the most advanced system ever introduced in this entire market. Um, nothing, there's nothing like it. And it's actually going to be head, uh, featured at CES in Vegas. Uh, it was it next week. Uh, so we're really excited for that to be able to show off on the technology, uh, you know, in front of, you know, 100,000 people. Cool. So, um, and, and so well, uh, once you build the product, did you like, did you pre-sell it before? Or like w when you build it, you started to sell it? How, how, how did that work? Well, so we've how, got... How, how did you know basically that the product will sell? That's, that's, you know, like, because you've invested a lot of like money, resources, time into, into developing the product. How did you know that the product will actually sell? I mean, it's scary, right? It's, it's like, you know, you spend, you know, millions, I, you know, I'm going into my, my bank account and <clears throat> transferring, you know, million dollars, million dollars from my personal account into what could look like a black hole, right? Because when you're doing research and development, you're paying, you're paying salaries. You don't know, right? And you just, it's, it's going out and nothing's coming back because this is a new product. And then when that's all done, all the research development patents, um, we had a globalizer patent, so you're paying for, you know, all the countries for for the trademarks, the patents. So you can imagine it just it adds up. It's like remodeling a house. You say the budget's five hundred thousand, and it ends up being two million. Uh, and so the thing is, uh, I know that. Or actually, here's here's the be here's the best way to explain it. So I was at dinner the other day, or not the other day. It was uh, more than a few months ago. And uh, one of my buddies says, Josh, I bought, I bought snow and, uh, and it worked. And I was like, that's great. Like, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. And he's like, here's the thing though. What else am I going to buy from you? And I said, uh, I said, well, would you buy toothpaste from us? Would you buy mouthwash from us? Would you buy floss from us? Would you buy boo boo? And he's like, yeah, because it worked and I like the product. I said, that's the thing. I said, that's exactly right. And I said, uh, what, uh, and one of my mentors told me, he said, uh, never, never fuck up the base is what he said, word for word. Uh, and what that means is that whatever's making you money, it's easy to want to go and create, you know, all this stuff. The reason we're not selling toothpaste at this exact moment is because we spent the last year 
uh, cannibalizing our own product, which is nuts. But if you look at the best companies in the world, that's exactly what they do. So Apple comes out with Apple 9, or Apple, they never did come out with Apple 9. They come out with Apple uh, iPhone 8, then they come out with the iPhone 10. And it cannibalizes the, the last product because yeah. people no longer want the 8, they want the 10. You have to have big balls to do that because you are essentially destroying your own, your, your own market. Instead of signing the same thing, like Crest White Strips has been signing the same thing for 20 years, we went back in and said, let's take, go back to the drawing board and start from scratch and say, okay, take all the feedback and let's recreate the product. And people are like, what are you doing? It's selling. People love it. It has all the great reviews. Why are you doing this? And we said, because it's not good enough. And the consumers think it's good enough, but we know it's not good enough. So for us, we knew it was going to sell because we, we've been doing some pre-sales for sure. That's been going really well. We're launching a, a Kickstarter campaign, even though the product's already out. Um, we've got a, a couple of bottles that we haven't uh, released yet that we want to build excitement around, get people excited about it. But uh, you know, for us, we knew it was going to sell because we're already selling a similar system, but this is 10 times better. And it's not you know, that far from a price point difference that people would want to buy it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's kind of, you, you have to feel good into it, uh, your intuition about can you sell this? And the truth is, you know, we've, got, we've got the confidence that we can sell just about anything, um, especially if it's 10 times better than everything else on the market. Cool. Um, so what, what do you see are the biggest mistakes that people are making when, when they're starting online or where, when they try to scale their business online? <coughs> I think that uh, you have to look at, um, you have to look at the positioning of, of what you're selling is really important. So um, if you're selling a, a lower price product with low, lower margins, lower price product doesn't necessarily mean lower margin. You can make something for a penny and sell it for a dollar. If you have better margins than just about anybody, but um, you have to think of, are you in the volume business? Are you in the custom special order business? You can, you can make millions at all of these and billions in all of these, but understanding the position of your brand is very important. And I think the biggest mistake is um, not, not focusing on, on, on something that you feel really good about. It's, it's natural and it's okay to, to dibble dabble and try a hundred different things. Everyone's done it. I've done it. Everybody does it. I'm not, I'm not trying to shame people for shiny objects in them. It's always going to be there. And if you're a marketer, you can sell anything. So co you're constantly seeing ideas and like, Oh, I can sell a lot of that. I can sell a lot of that. And that's natural. But if you want to uh, make serious impact, it's made in the depths of mastery. It's, and, and you have to know more about your product, more about your market. Uh, you know, and I obsess over our product. I obsess over our industry. I obsess over teeth whitening, um, you know, oral care, oral health. I obsess over it. I can almost, you know, I subscribe to the Google News feeds. I'm seeing everything. I can almost hear it when something, you know, drops. You can't do that if you're doing 50 things at once. You don't have that level of intimacy. You know, I, I make love to my product every night because I want to know every single curve, shape, filling. I talk to my customers on the phone. I talk to my team. You know, we've got 2 million monthly shoppers. I'm watching how they interact with the site, what's broken, what's not. You can't do that if you've got 100 things going on. So you, I, what I always say is pick something. You, you literally, you know, I know a guy who sells toilets, you know, makes hundreds of millions a year. I know a guy who sells bookshelves. You know, whatever it is, just pick one and go deep into it and think about how you want the brand to look and how it's going to stand out from your competitors because that's going to help a lot. And uh, I would say focus, it, you know, people, they start to focus and then what happens is a scarcity mindset comes in and it's like, this is too good to be true. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not going to last. So I need to build something else or I need to build something else. Um, <clears throat> that's like, a, it's like if you're married and your wife has a bunch of men lined up, you know, in the other room, just in case you don't work out, they're, they're there. And she spends time with each one, an hour a day with each of those guys, and then gives you three hours a day, but she keeps them warmed up. You're never going to get the full commitment and the full level of what you could have unless you go all the way in. So I tell people, look, if you're making some money, you, you kind of like what you're doing, go in. If you're drop shipping, move from drop shipping 
to shipping yourself, to getting an office, make that commitment to, to building something bigger if that's what you want. So if you start a business now in 2019, like no money, like just, just having the knowledge that you have, like what would you do? Would you do drop shipping or would you start like as an, as an agency, like helping like clients with some services? What would you do? I love, I, you know, I love the, um, the agency model because it's, it's profitable, uh, right out the gate. You don't have to have a ton of employees out the gate you can be yourself. Um, you're learning behind the scenes of a lot of businesses. You're understanding the profit margins, you're understanding how the businesses work, how they operate, um, the different roles in the business. Uh, I think that it's one of the best ways um, to learn and get paid to learn. So you can get paid to learn a lot. That's huge. Um, and then once you kind of have all these opportunities in front of you and you're learning, choosing one of those and saying, okay, I'm going to take you know 50% of the money I'm making each month as a consultant and I'm going to put it into this project. And that because keep in mind, you got to do it's one thing. It's like people, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurs would be like, I want to have a hundred different products. I want a hundred different things. The truth is, um, you know, Chabani yogurt, billion dollar yogurt company. They have one product. They have different flavors. One yeah. product, five hour energy drink. They make billions of dollars a year. They have one product, Red Bull, one product. They don't have 50 products. They have different flavors, different sizes, but they don't have different products. So the truth is you don't need a hundred products. You need a couple products or, or, or if it's a software platform or whatever it is, you need one singular focus. But I would say if I was starting right now, I would uh, figure out a skill that I'm good at, get better at it and just start, you know, be involved in groups on Facebook forums, um, start contributing, giving value. People are going to reach out and say, Hey, do you do consulting? Yes, I do. Boom, boom, boom. That's how I would, uh, you know, I would start, that's how I started and uh, it worked for me. You know, now we don't do any services. I don't do any consulting. I don't sell any courses. I have nothing like that. But um, for me, uh, I, would, I would start off as a consultant and use that money and the time and the learnings to kind of fine tune. Now you don't want to do that for 20 years and then you never do it because you're scared of that. That's the thing too, is once you start making money, you get complacent, it takes up all your time so you got to be willing, if you're going to do that, you've got to work 12 hours doing this and six hours researching what you're about to do. And, and that distribution of time needs to start shifting mm -hmm. uh, over time. If, uh, and then it, this completely takes over. But if you're going to work for 10 hours and then watch Netflix for six hours and just kind of fantasize about having your own brand, that's not good. You have to be willing to work 16 hours a day, 12 of them as, your, as a consultant to make the cash and six of those or whatever uh, I'm researching, and then that starts to move and move and move. Cool. Uh, so with your, with your brand, you have uh, some major celebrities like Floyd Mayweather and um, um, Rob Gronkowski. So um, how do you get those people as, as your like, uh, partners, as your influencers? Because, you know, yeah. there are a lot, of, a lot of different companies, but, you know, like, for example, Floyd Mayweather, he, he doesn't promote just any, you know, just every one of them. So how did you get them? So Floyd was an interesting case because um, Conor McGregor had promoted um, an Australian product. High Smile. Um, in space, High Smile. And so, um, uh, you know, Floyd beat Conor uh, in the fight, obviously. And um, he, he said, he saw that Connor did that pose and he, he was like, oh, that's, that's an ugly little pink product. He's like, you know, weak. He's like, I want to find an American company that has the best. He's like, I want the best. So, you know, we do a ton of advertising. We do a lot of you know, other stuff with influencers. So he stumbled across, you know, the product and his team stumbled across the product and said, uh, this, is some, this is the one. Like this is by far, this is the Louis Vuitton of, of the market. And so Floyd was like, of course, like this totally makes sense. This is the sexiest. It's American. I love it. Um, so that's when our teams got connected and said, hey, Floyd wants to do a deal with, with Snow. He wants to be, you know, partner up and figure out how we can sell this to, to beat Connor again. You know, it's like I beat you in the ring and I beat you off, you know, out of the boxing thing. Um, and so uh, we said, let's do it. Absolutely. Our product is at least 10 times better than anything else out there. Um, you know, you're the best ever fighter. Let's do it. And so he, um, you know, that's where we came up with the 24 karat gold, 
um, uh, you know, mouthpiece and all that. And we've got some um, special edition uh, champagne mouthwash and champagne toothpaste coming out, you know, um, that's going to, you know, Floyd will be pushing that as well. So that, that was an interesting case of just doing a lot of advertising, doing a lot of influencer posting, just asking people, customers to post about us. And then um, Rob and Chuck, I, I was actually on a, a Shark Tank spinoff show on this no longer around. It was on Verizon's network. And uh, Rob was uh, the executive producer for the show. And so I went on that show and uh, got to meet them, uh, showed them the product, showed them what we were doing. Uh, it was only maybe a few months old at the time. And uh, they, everybody, all the judges, including the host of the show, went in on the deal. So it was the largest deal they had done. Um, everybody was in. And, um, you know, they kind of saw what I was, what I was building. They, they, they saw that it was something bigger. And I think we had like two employees at the time. I mean, it was just really an infancy. And so Rob and Chuck became my uh, equity partners and, uh, and, and started to post about it. And then the whole NFL you know, came in, the whole UFC came in because, you know, these are two of the most successful athletes, well, three with Floyd in different areas. But what's unique is that they're men and most of our customers are women, but I wanted to tap into the male demographic because traditionally uh, whitening is seen as more of a feminine kind of beauty type of thing. But in reality, Floyd Mayweather wears a mouthpiece when he fights. Yeah. Rob Gronkowski yeah. wears a mouthpiece when he plays football. Chuck Liddell wears a mouthpiece when he fights. So the mouthpiece, this is the same thing. It's a mouthpiece, but it whitens your teeth, makes you feel more confident, you know, all of that. So the, it ended up working really well for us. Um, I enjoy working with them. And now we've got, you know, hundreds of celebrities that have come as a result of that. Um, but it's just starting small, not being afraid to reach out uh, and just seeing what happens. And is that like typically, um, because I'm, I'm more like paid, paid advertising, that's, that's my specialty. So how did you how did you figure out like the influencer marketing and all of that like is that still like books and YouTube and learning from other people? Yeah, I mean, I so I I uh, I was lucky to st study uh, you know under uh, Robert Cialdini. I went to Arizona State University where he was a professor and he wrote the book Influence. And uh, you know, I I realized that it's it's um, human nature to monkey see monkey do. And, and I say the new version is monkey see, monkey buy. And so, you know, it's that influence subconsciously that if someone sees a product used over and over and over again, they desire it after a while. And so uh, because of social media and the emergence of Instagram, very uh, image friendly, um, I realized that we needed to um, get our product uh, in as many hands as possible. And so, you know, I hired a small team to just email every influencer um, with anyone, anywhere between 10,000 followers and 10 million followers and just get their rates. Um, if they, if they were to post and say, and a lot of them were just send me free product. And if I like it, I'll post it. I said, Oh, great. Our customers, we asked them to post. I don't care if you have one follower or 5 million followers. I do not care if you post about us. It could be positive. It could be negative. I don't care if you post about us, we'll send you a gift card. So just incentivizing that over time, even if you have five customers and you call each one and I say, hey, I'll give you a $50 gift card if you post on your Instagram, whatever you want to say works. Okay, I'll do it. Five customers and three out of five will do it. And what happens is that it starts, people start seeing it, they buy it, and then it becomes a habit. And it's like everybody, um, Fashion Nova did this with their clothing line and it became culturally acceptable to have snow teeth writing in your mouth and take a picture. But if it's a knockoff product, it's not cool. So you create this ripple effect on the brand where it's like, it's cool to post snow, but if you're using white strips, ugh, you know, don't post using white strips. Or, or if you're the dentist getting whitening, that's kind of weird. So, so it's cool to post snow, it's not cool to post anything else. So that's the ripple effect. But how I got started was just literally emailing um, on Instagram. You go to their, their profile, you say, hey, can I pay you to review my product, positive or negative? If you like it, post about it. Okay, $300, okay, $200 here. You can give them a coupon code, whatever. But you have to look at it from the branding eyes, not from the ROI eyes. It has to be from, you know, if you look at it, what's my return on investment? The truth is people are gonna see it on Instagram, they're gonna Google it, your product, then they're gonna buy it on Amazon. So yeah. it's like, do, do, do. And so you're like, oh, you know, uh, it didn't work. Or they're going to see it from one of their friends 
and then they're going to see a Facebook ad and then they're going to see your YouTube ad and then they're going to buy it on Amazon. So I was like, it's so hard to track that. All I care about is, I, is uh, mind share. I want 100% mind share in our space. And so we get 9.9 .9 million uh, unique eyeballs on our advertisements every month. And so I want that to be 100 million. And so we have to figure out more products, more expansion, international translations. I want 100 million people every single month to see our products because that's getting mind share. And I don't care if they buy or not. All I'm getting is mind share, snow, 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 snow. And so, you know, if you study, you know, some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, dictators of how they spread a message, uh, there's, there's really interesting to understand that you can do it for bad, you can do it for good, you can do it to build a brand. Um, it's the same tactics over and over again. Cool. Um, so you advertise heavily on Facebook um, for your brand. So as an insider, um, what will be your forecast for Facebook ads for the next like two, three years? <coughs> yeah, so we spend across the companies, uh, you know, next year we'll probably spend uh, 40 to $50 billion in house. Um, but what we're, we're doing is we're, we're shifting a lot of our spend from Facebook to Instagram, mm. um, which, which is smart uh, for Mark Zuckerberg to acquire Instagram. WhatsApp, you know, is, is a huge opportunity uh, on the advertising front. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for more advertising options on WhatsApp. Um, Amazon advertising, uh, you know, they're putting a lot of money behind their technology. I think Amazon is going to become a formidable competitor in the uh, advertising space. Um, Pinterest advertising, um, which is uh, drives discovery traffic, so it's not bottom of the funnel where it's going to convert right away. But Pinterest has a lot of, of reach and, and power, um, especially for our demographic of women. So uh, I think that Facebook is going to get more expensive. Um, I've seen this happen with Google. If you look at what happened with Google, same thing is going to happen with Facebook. They're a public company. They have to make more money. They're, literally, their stock price is determined by how much money they make. How do they make more money? They have to make more money per user. How do they make more money per user? They have to show more ads per user. So that means that there's gonna be a lot more ads flooding every single area of Facebook, which means uh, banner fatigue, you know, people get tired of the, of the ads after a while. This happened to MySpace, and that's why people migrated to Facebook, because Facebook didn't have the advertising that MySpace did. But now Facebook is becoming the MySpace. So I think that uh, Instagram is great, you know, Instagram will continue to grow for the next two years. Um, Facebook will become more and more expensive. Um, you know, influencers, what's going to happen is Instagram's going to release the same update that Facebook did where it kills organic reach. And when that happens right now, influencers, it's kind of like a bubble, and, you know, especially the ones that have like 3 million uh, followers because they show pictures of their butt, you know, and they're sexy, you know, they're the Instagram models. Uh, and nothing to knock them. All I'm saying is that right now there's not a lot of accountability and reporting with influencer marketing. So it's like, uh, three thousand dollars, and it's like, where did you make that price up? You know, like, where's the, the actual price there? And so, what's going to happen is Instagram doesn't make any money if if we have endorsement deals with our with our celebrities, they don't get anything of that. Guess whose platform it is? Instagram. Guess who needs to make money? Instagram. Guess who they're owned by? Facebook. Facebook rolled out the same update and it killed all the big pages, Vira Nova, all the viral websites. It killed all of them. Instagram is going to do the same thing in, in the next year. And it's going to kill a lot of the influencers that have not figured out how to price their post, how to build a brand, how to sell products. And it's okay because the good ones will move to the next platform like they always do. And they'll be big there as well. I seen a uh, Jeffree star, uh, Jeffree star cosmetics go from MySpace to YouTube to, uh, uh, to now Instagram. And now he's got Jeffree star cosmetics, which is making hundreds of millions of dollars. So I've seen, I've seen uh, um, you know, influencers make it through that transition, but what happens is it, it becomes like a funnel and people start to drop off. The nice thing is if you're an advertiser, uh, um, you don't have to worry so much about the organic stuff because it's actually exciting. Um, I, I, I personally, as an advertiser, I like that they're going to kill organic because I want to pay. I want to pay to play. Um, so for us, I think it's exciting times ahead. Um, I think that uh, Facebook's going to make some big, interesting updates with, with Instagram. And, uh, and we'll see. I, I'm excited for it. And so with uh, influencer marketing, like 
you, you didn't have like any way of tracking the results. Like, can you track the results by like discount code that, that influencers are using? Or Yeah, you could do, um, you could do the link in the bio as well um, with the UTM, uh, you know, tracking link. You could do a tr uh, coupon code. Um, you could do the swipe up um, on the story and on Snapchat where they swipe up and go straight to the tracking link. So those are like, but you're never going to get 100% tracking, but that helps you at least get a good idea of like how it did. Um, and then you could ask for statistics of how many people saw the story. Instagram gives you um, the insights of how many saw it, how many clicked, how many did all that. Um, and then I try to just back it into like a CPM. And I say, okay, if it's a $40 CPM, you know, that's reasonable as a $100 CPM. I try to back it into something that's, that's, that's uh, digestible. Um, other than that, it's more about um, getting the coverage and the eyeballs uh, and, and just kind of putting it in front of as many people. Because by the time they come and see our Facebook ad, um, they're going to convert more likely because they've seen it five times before. So I think of it more as like it feeds the funnel. It feeds it and it kind of massages it and the conversion rate and all of that. And it's not directly to drive sales when we're doing influencer stuff. Cool. Um, so, so you advertise worldwide was all right. Correct. Um, and you ship from United States or from, from other countries as well? <coughs> we have a couple of distribution centers, but, um, I would say 80% of our shipments are out of Arizona here in, in the U S. Cool. Uh, so as a founder and CEO of multiple brands and companies, uh, I think you're really busy. Can you give us advice how you can manage successfully, uh, business and personal life? Um, I would just say, uh, you know, like right now I'm running to a, a, another meeting right now once I get off with you. Um, and I, I would say, uh, push yourself to, uh, I use Google calendar. I, I schedule everything in. Um, I even schedule party time. I schedule sleep time. I schedule, you know, I, I try to schedule it in so that I feel good about having a productive day. And so I work on weekends with it's Sunday. We're on, we're on a call together. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, I don't have to, I don't have to do any of this. I don't have to, have to work. I don't think, you know, I could have just been retired and done, but I want to do this. I love to do this. So when people are like, I don't have time or I have this, I have that. I said, you got to make the time. And so the truth is you have to make your schedule, your bitch, you have to make your mind, your bitch. And, and, and that's it. There's no, there's no like secret, like uh, meditation. I don't meditate. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, not, not that I don't, I believe meditation. I love, I meditate my way. I get massages. I swim, things like that. But, um, you know, when I meditate, the best meditation is when I'm in flow state and I'm just working, or I'm just cranking through work. I'm researching, I'm reading, I'm thinking. Um, so I would say schedule as best as you can be ruthless with who you spend your time with, be ruthless with, um, you know, events that you go to, um, come, come with an agenda, but also be open-minded. Uh, but ultimately it's, is, hey, what do I want to get done today? What can I get done today? And then audit yourself. Are you spending six hours on Netflix? Are you just lounging around the house? Are you kind of working or fake working? Uh, be ruthless. I, I'm my own, uh, I'm my biggest critic. Uh, you know, if I catch myself, I'm like, what are you doing, you idiot? You know, I'm like, oh, okay. And I, I have that little, like two little people on my shoulder as I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh. But, but I schedule in the party time. If I want to have fun or I'm going to an event or whatever it is, I, I schedule it in and I have a great time because I feel productive and I've scheduled it. So I would just say, if you're not using Google Calendar, if you're not scheduling you know, your, your nap time, your Netflix time, your date time, and then your work time, um, you're not go it's going to be very difficult for you to make progress in the way that you could. Um, that's why... I've been able to do so much in a short period of time is because I just, I just whip my schedule and I say, make it happen, make it happen. And I fit in 20 things in a day. And most people fit are happy to get like one thing done a day. I'm happy if I get 20 things done a day. Um, and that means sometimes I have to fly around and zoom around and do all these things, but I love the feeling of being productive. Cool. So what's, what's your typical schedule looks like uh, for, for a given day? 
Uh, it's usually, uh, you know, the, when I wake up in the morning, it's usually going through emails. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, don't look at your emails the first thing in the morning. It could become a time suck. That's true. That's absolutely true. But uh, it gives me a layout for the day of kind of, you know, who's blowing me up, you know, what's any fires going on, what's going on. I check Slack. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'll check social media after that. Once I'm done with that, I'll reward myself with some social media, um, you know, 30 minutes of that. And then, uh, you know, I have a lot of meetings during the week. Uh, and then, at, uh, you know, meetings all day, uh, working in between the meetings. And then when I get home, you know, I'll work out, I'll have dinner, um, you know, run some errands. And then I get to do more of my deep work, which is like catch up on emails, research, read my books, podcasts. Uh, you know, audio books, all that stuff at night uh, is really where I get the heavy work done. And, you know, I'll go to sleep at one or two in the morning and I'll be up at, you know, probably eight or nine in the morning. I'm not a huge early morning fan. Uh, I like to work late into the night because nobody's bothering me. Uh, and that's just how my body works. But uh, usually I'm working from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. at night. I'm, I'm in meetings. I'm on calls. I'm doing whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm, I'm constantly going, especially during the weekday. And then the weekend, I like to have fun. So what I do is I take my nighttime sessions usually, and that'll be for party, for fun, for social events. And then I get my uh, work done during the daytime, like at a coffee shop or, you know, just kind of mix it up. But I'm always, I'm always reading. I'm always thinking, uh, even when I'm in, even when I'm in a nightclub, you know, I'm on Quora and I'm reading stuff, you know, like, you know, I'm having a good time. I'm dancing and everything, but I'll, I'll think of something and I'll, my mind is always going. I'm like, how does that work? And I'm like, shh, 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 looking it up. So you have to, you know, have that thirst for knowledge will, will really drive you a long way. Cool. Um, so um, did you have any like failure or apparent failure that set you up for success? Uh, let's see here. That's a good one. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to have to run right now, by the way, I'm going to run off to the next meeting, but I think this is a good, this is a good one to end off on because everybody talks about the success, you know, and that's what everybody wants to talk about. I would say, uh, oh, the biggest failure, you know, honestly, uh, it, it sounds cliche cause I always talk about it, but it's, uh, really thinking, uh, Thinking selfishly, honestly, um, really thinking about, you know, how can I make, I'm going to make money for myself. How can I, uh, and this is legitimate because this is what led to my, my, a little bit of depression that I had is I was thinking through, I want to have this car. I want to have this, or I want people to respect me. It was like ego driven. And, uh, if you don't keep your ego in check, I don't care how big you are. You can be the, the emperor. You will fall. Um, Louis the Thirteenth was beheaded because of an ego and not paying attention to his people and his team. And so for me, it was thinking selfishly and thinking too small, uh, and realizing that uh, I needed to think a lot bigger. And uh, you know, I feel like uh, every billionaire that I listen to on YouTube, whatever, they always say think bigger, uh, focus. Um, and I would say oh, maybe those two actually. I mean, those two, I didn't. Fo I had a hard time focusing. Uh, you know, for a little while, trying a lot of stuff that was never going to be a, a hundred million dollar company, you know, just like little things that would like little trends, like, Oh, drop ship this or do this, or, you know, these little things. And they, it's exciting because you're like, Oh, I'm making some money. Oh, but it's like a, a dose of like cocaine or heroin. Like you have to keep going back to it. And, uh, I wasted a lot of time doing a lot of those things where if I would have just focused, um, you know, we're doing really well now because we've mastered that now. We still did well before, but I feel like if we put all the energy that we had in 10 projects and the money that you spread across 10 projects and you put it into one, um, we would have made even bigger progress. Um, and that's something that I recommend to everybody. Think bigger, think longer term. Um, don't go jumping on trends. Um, you know, I don't like to jump trends because I always say uh, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, you know, don't lose sight of the forest staring at the trees. I'm not sure who said it, but I love that quote because the forest, you know where you're going, but there's trees along the way and they're distracting. And so if you start staring at the tree, all of a sudden the time goes by and you lose track of where you're at. You lose track of your goals. So stay focused, think bigger. Don't, don't limit yourself. I don't care. I, I'm a, a you know, I, I started with nothing, uh, no money. I just had a big dream 
And if I can do it, anybody could do it 100%. Uh, I, just, I, I just read a lot, learned everything. I self-taught for the majority of, uh, of what I know for free. I, you know, I didn't have to go to school to learn this. I didn't have to pay anybody to learn this. I learned it for 100% free. And I believe that information should be free and it should be available to everybody because it's truly the equalizer in the economy uh, and in the world. Information is the equalizer, uh, not money. Money is not the equalizer. Information is the equalizer. The access to information is the equalizer. Cool. Uh, thank you, Josh. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Um, thank you very much. Some very good insights. So I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be listening myself to this interview once again because there are some golden nuggets. I'll, I'll make some notes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, let me know if there's anything you need help with. And I'm, I'll, once you get it out, I'll share it all over social media too. All right. Okay. Cool. Talk to you later. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.